I'm going to read this statement of purpose from a student who was admitted to Cornell's Master's in Architecture program, which is one of the top five um, Master's in Architecture programs in the country. So we'll talk about what works really well in this essay and how you can apply some of the writing style from this essay to your statement of purpose. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. You can also come to my office hours where I give feedback on essays and download a version of this essay when you sign up for my newsletter. In the summer of 2009, I traveled to Cambodia on a building restoration project with the Institute of International Education to help small villages build homes and churches in areas still affected by the Khmer Rouge genocide. The Khmer Rouge, a radical communist government, took nearly 2 million lives in the late 1970s and lingered till the 1990s. As a young adolescent, I wanted to make an impact with the idealism of building equitable societies for countries less fortunate than mine. My time there was spent doing hard labor such as mixing cement and laying the foundation. I didn't know which was worse, wheelbarrowing large boulders through muddy paths in a tropical climate or the meager portions of seemingly unappetizing foreign cuisine that followed. Some days I wondered if the task was worth it. Even though I was not cognizant of it then, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served. It turned out to be a seminal experience of how a direct impact was made through architecture. Something that works well about this essay is the storytelling up front. It captures the reader and it makes you want to keep reading. It's like interesting hook to see how this type of service project led to a person's interest in architecture. Something that's really interesting about this candidate is their background is actually not in architecture. So it's an interesting story to start how they got into the field of architecture. And I know some people are worried about applying to grad school when they don't have a background in that field. And this essay is a really great example of how to demonstrate, um, you know, wanting to move into that field, even when you don't have direct experience in that field. Something to be cautious of when using stories like this is I see in a lot of essays, people using examples of working in developing countries um, and, and stuff like that. And you want to be careful when you use these type of examples that you don't come off with kind of the white savior complex of going to a developing country and helping improve it. Something that works in this essay is we see in, in these like quotation marks um, make an impact because the, that kind of tells me that the person is is talking about that um, that kind of idealism of wanting to make an impact and when you get there you actually see that it's a lot more challenging and your role is not really going to help make an impact much at all in a short amount of time. And so we see that that person is dropping a hint of uh, a kind of criticism of that role that often happens in these service type projects. The following year, one of my professors in a 2D design course asked me to consider applying to the Art Center College of Design. I was used to drawing nude models and perspectives, but the concept of design was foreign. Graphic design was fun, exciting, and engaging, but suffice to say, I was a poor student. It wasn't long until I dropped out of college and enlisted in the Marine Corps. The time throughout my enlistment had absolutely nothing to do with design or creativity. Instead, I had spent my time waking up early, making my bed, and hiking long distances. As it turned out, these were remarkably valuable lessons in leadership, character, and perspective. It was mixing cement and laying foundation for the journey to come. What had felt like a hiatus from school was an education in growing up. Again, we see some really great storytelling in the essay. And as the reader, we're going along on their journey. How did they get to wanting to study architecture? So in this, we see that they went from design to dropping out of college and now enlisting in the Marine Corps, which that's a very different experience than the average person who's applying to architecture school. But they tell us what's relevant about that, that that was a part of their journey of growing up, that they needed to develop um, that skill set that they got from the military to be able to get to where they they are today. So we see that they're telling us why that was relevant, even though, you know, the Marine Corps is very different than doing what you do in, in architecture. The other thing I want to point out is the way this person is doing showing instead of telling, which I talk a lot about in my essays. It would have been very different if the person said, uh, I joined the Marines and I learned perseverance and hard work. Right. That's what they're that's one way of telling us what they did. But instead, they show us by saying uh, in this sentence right here, instead, I had spent my time waking up early, making my bed and hiking long distances. In that sentence, we can visualize what they were doing in terms of that hard work and the commitment of being in that environment of the military. And so when you see yourself making statements of like, I hope to X, Y, and Z, or I learned X, Y, and Z, don't just tell us with a statement, actually describe it visually. What was the thing you learned? How did you learn it? How did you come to understand it? And that's how you can build out these storytelling elements in your own essay. 
After my four years of service, I reoriented my focus back on studying design at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. My work progressed quickly and opened opportunities to work at the Aspen Art Museum and the Walker Art Center. When I first stepped into the AAM, I was confounded by the transparency of the building. You could see the museum's internal structure from the outside as well as the view of Aspen's mountainscape from within. Shigeru Ban's vision for the AAM was to unify the building and its surroundings. Compare this with Herzog and Demuren's expansion of the WAC, an aluminum mesh cube nearly devoid of windows, Frank Gehry meets brutalism. These structures, the aggregate of materials of an entity and its relationship to us and its place, was similar to how my graphic design work has always been most interesting when exploring visual form through material, texture, and typographic structure. In this paragraph, the person is setting us up to show their understanding of architecture. You know, they have a design background in graphic design art, but not architecture specifically. And in this paragraph, they're describing that they actually do understand the field of architecture by name dropping different um, buildings and styles and architects. So it shows us that this person has done their homework. They really understand what they're getting into with architecture. This is something um, I see a lot when people are applying to um, programs in fields that they don't have a background in they often can't write up paragraphs describing their experience or projects they've worked on so instead it's this is a good method to use to show how you come to see and understand the field based on you know what you've done your homework on in terms of like reading about the program reading about the field and showing that you have an understanding of the field so this is a great example of how to do that when you don't have actual project experience in the field Studying graphic design has taught me to feel the visual weight in relation to its physical. Good design requires an understanding of how it translates across multiple mediums, meaning materials matter just as much as aesthetics do. Thus, the ability to think with your hands is a necessary skill of a designer. I am most excited when investigating and experimenting with materials. How does cold metal bend? What are the advantages of wood and what are its limits? What are the limits of 3D printing? These questions often lead me to more meaningful discourse regarding the boundary between pragmatism and idealism. In this paragraph, they're telling us how they think about architecture. What are the questions that come up for them? What is their perspective and point of view on architecture? And this is a great example because a problem I see in a lot of essays is people just talking generically about the field, not putting their point of view about the field and about their approach to the field in the essay. And the admissions committee, they wanna know who you are and how you think about the concepts that you're about to go study. And a really great way of doing that is borrowing this technique where we see the person pose questions that are relevant and important to them. You can borrow that technique about what are the questions that come up for you? What is your point of view and how you see this work? And this is a great technique you can do to show that in your essay. Beginning to understand the shared lexicon between graphic design and architecture confirmed my decision to pursue a career in architecture and to continually explore the dichotomy of design, of form and function. Architecture does not end with the design of a building, but rather begins with it. In other words, I believe that it's not the what that's so important, but the how. How can a building improve a community, especially the ones that have been devastated by natural disasters and race politics? Climate change and gentrification are more urgent than ever and have now become a part of the structure's equation. Moreover, as new technologies are fundamentally changing the urban landscape, constructing buildings raises a set of environmental, political, and spatial issues that will decisively affect how we inhabit the future. I believe this poses as many opportunities as challenges for what architecture could look like for future generations. Through Cornell's education, I hope to further extend my critical thinking in design processes and design systems to create palpable relationships between culture and environment. This is another great paragraph showing the person's point of view about architecture. Here we see they're not just target talking about what architecture is, but what architecture can be in terms of solving some of these social challenges. And a paragraph like this is particularly important for people who don't have as much work experience in the field. Like I mentioned before, you know, if you have a lot of experience, you describe projects you've worked on and how you came to do those projects. But for this person without much experience, they're instead describing how they see architecture 
architecture. And that's really important because it shows that they're ready to move into the field of architecture, even though they don't have specific experience in architecture. They're also making a link between their background in graphic design and its connection to architecture. And so when you don't have a background in the field, you want to be able to leverage previous experience, previous skill sets, and show how they can be leveraged to do the thing you now want to do. So we're seeing these great connections here in this paragraph. Not only is Cornell AAP known for its forward thinking in technology and innovation, but also its integration of sustainable practice and methodology. What I admire the most about the MARC program at AAP is that they consider the broader conversation of politics and education in architecture. I most look forward to engaging with Professor Jason Long and Professor Joan Ackman because through them, I know that I will have a strong foundation of architectural history, theory, and practice. Furthermore, I am eager to learn from Professor Benjamin Markham how acoustics can transform the spaces we inhabit. I see myself being successful at Cornell AAP's open studio environment where I'm surrounded by a cohort of students who are encouraged to strive to democratize spaces that face social economic challenges. This paragraph shows the person's alignment with the program. Something I see that's often a problem in people's essays is they're not specific enough with describing the program and what they want to do or get out of the program or how the resources from the program help them achieve what they want to achieve. So this person, they're naming professors and you can see that they're actually talking about what the professors do and what they want to get out of studying with those professors. So you want to take this as an example. Another thing they do is they talk about the student body. Something I see a lot of students do is say a really vague or generic sentence like, at UCLA, I will thrive in a diverse and intellectual environment. It's like something like that is very generic and anyone can say that. So you want to be more specific. This is a good example here in this last sentence about how they want to be surrounded by a cohort that strives to democratize spaces that face social economic challenges. So that's a great example of getting more specific. It doesn't take genocide to understand that there are communities that need healing. Our future buildings must contribute to solving for disasters, poverty, and equality that is already present throughout our cities. Architecture must transcend the aesthetic of a building as a reflection of society and the impact it creates in its immediate surroundings. Making an impact, therefore, begins in small and little unsexy ways, in the struggle between the architect and his her practice, in mixing cement and laying the foundation. If my journey with architecture could begin with this school, I'm confident that Cornell could shape me as an architect who contributes to democratizing our cultural landscape as well as finding solutions for our built environment. This is a really powerful conclusion because it ties back a lot of the elements that we've seen throughout the whole essay. They kind of allude to that mixing cement, laying the foundation from the first paragraph of working um, in Cambodia and referencing the genocide, but also coming back to these ideas of what architecture can be used for. And we can see that it's a really powerful perspective that they're talking about. So if I'm a person who's on an admissions committee, I would be interested in this person because of the strong stance that they're taking in um, their perspective and point of view of what they bring as a lens to architecture and how they approach it. So even though this person doesn't have experience in architecture, they've shown that there's someone who's done some deep thinking about architecture and it, they have an interesting story of how they got to this journey to find architecture now. And so I'm someone who's interested in learning more about this person and taking a chance on them. And of course, with any application to a master's of architecture program, your portfolio is a critical component. So we're going to talk about a few tips on your portfolio in a second, but before we we do that, I want to mention that this person came to my free office hours about three or four times. And each time we did a lot of thinking on the storytelling and really trying to uplift what was important and what was relevant to get to this crisp thing you see at the end here. And it was really challenging to think about how to integrate their experience in the military uh, and the journey that they had. And so we did a lot of back and forth to come up with a story of how they got to where they are today. And some of the challenges they struggled with at first were how to talk about some of these things like what happened to them in the military. And additionally, at the beginning, there was not a lot of those storytelling elements. So we talked about how to pump that up a little bit more. And then originally too, there was a lot of what I call, um, architecture lingo bingo, which is really, uh, really something you've seen a lot of architecture writing where there's a lot of these vague words like the inner spatial connections between the, and it's like a lot of this kind of very vague abstract language, which actually makes writing and reading writing really hard. So we took a lot of that out to make the writing sound a lot more clear and crisp. So come to office hours if you want some help with those things. 
Now let's talk about some portfolio tips. Almost all the universities you apply to will have a portfolio presentation day where they talk to you about what they want to see in a portfolio and what makes it successful. So you definitely want to check those out because you want to tailor your portfolio to the school that you're applying for. So get support you need there so that you can create a really powerful portfolio. These are just some general tips on how to have a great portfolio. You want to start out with your strongest project and end with one of your strongest projects. You don't want to keep all your best up at front. You want to make a lasting impression when they open your portfolio and then the last thing they see before they close your portfolio. Tip number two, when it comes to presenting your images of models and things like that, you don't need a professional photography setup. You can do it DIY with just an iPhone and a portrait mode and use an all black or all white sheet or paper to set up a background for your images. Tip number three to keep in mind is really to not clutter the page. Have about one to two images per page, maybe three at the maximum, but you want to use a lot of white space and negative space so that your images and your work really stand out. You don't want to make it hard on the person's eyes to see what you want them to see. That brings us to tip number four, where you want to keep the description short. Less is more here. Let the images do the talking. For tip number five, keep in mind that these portfolios are going to be viewed digitally. So you want to make sure you have the right aspect ratio for the images. Many of the schools will specify the ratio they want to see them in. If not, use 1920 by 1080 ratio. That's the widescreen ratio on your slides so that it's the most compatible. For tip number six, you can show process work like work in progress. However, you want it to be complementary to the main work. You don't want it to be a lot of what you have. It should be something that aids the other pieces that you show. Finally, you want to think about the sequence of your work and how, what you're saying with that sequence. It might be telling a narrative. There should be some logic behind it. Maybe it's showing the growth and development of your work, or maybe it's showing um, categorizations of types of work that you've done, and maybe it shows the diversity of different types of work that you've done. So keep that in mind as you're putting together your portfolio. Just a reminder, you can come to my office hours. You can also download a copy of this essay when you sign up for my newsletter.